All the, the little winos from outside would come and knock on the door and ask my mom, Doña, he goes, can Jose sing for us? So she'd let me go out on the porch and uh, I would charge them a quarter for a song. She goes, my dad charges a dollar, so I'm gonna charge you a quarter. So it, it goes back a, a long way, you know, my music uh, in my life and in my family. Distinguished mariachi musician Jose Hernandez tells all about growing up in a multi-generational family of musicians. He goes on to create bands Mariachi Sol de Mexico, Mariachi Reina de Los Angeles, and start multiple mariachi music programs in schools. One of the students there was very, very quiet. He, little kid, wouldn't say nothing. He was like maybe nine or ten. He saw his father kill his mother in Mexico. And they sent him to Los Angeles to live with his grandmother. Two weeks into the mariachi program, you know, he started learning guitar. All of a sudden he started singing. He started playing around with all his little friends, you know, in the group. It changed his life completely. So how was he able to impact so many lives with his mariachi programs? Let's welcome mariachi maestro Jose Hernandez to today's Impactful Latinos. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you. And so we're going to talk a little bit about your beginnings, okay? Mm -hmm. um, because I know a lot of people already know a lot about your stories, um, but I really want to get into how you began. Mm -hmm. So you're, you come from a really long lineage of music. In your yes. Family. Can you tell me more about yeah, that? Yeah, we go back about, about six generations, you know, and... Um, I thought everybody in the world was a musician. You know, I grew up in, uh, basically in L.A. I mean, I was born in Baja California in Mexicali. And uh, I mean, I could go as far back as I was maybe three and a half years old. And I used to sing all the songs um, that my mother would like or ask me to learn, you know. Jose, can you learn this one? She'd put on the, the vinyl record, you know. And, um, and we were, at that time, we were in East Los Angeles. And... Uh, I would sing them, it was three and a half. And I would sing with falsetto and all, you know, all, these, all these popular songs of Miguel Aceves Mejia, who was a popular singer at that time, you know, in the early 60s. And uh, she used to tell me that, uh, that all the, the little winos from outside would come and knock on the door and ask my mom, Doña, he goes, can Jose sing for us? So she'd let me go out on the porch and uh, I would charge them a quarter for a song. She goes, my dad charges a dollar, so I'm gonna charge you a quarter. So it goes back a, a long way, you know, my, the music uh, in my life and in my family's, my family history, you know. Around how many generations, though? Six. Six. My father, Esteban, who was born in 1924, and my grandfather, Jose, who was born in uh, 1901. And his father, Crescencio, who was like 1863, and his father, Pedro. So it goes back a long, a long way. And which part of Mexico was uh, From Jalisco, the state of Jalisco, a little uh, ranch called La Cofradía Jalisco, which is on the other side of the town of Chapala, Lake Chapala, which is the largest lake in Latin America. It's a, it's a beautiful place, you know, and many songs have been written about Chapala, about the lake. And uh, yeah, that's where, my, where the, my roots are from. How did you end up from Mexico to come into the United States, and how was that transition for you? Well, my father and, uh, and my uncle uh, and my grandfather, they got together with a family called uh, the Sosa family, and they were also, I think, three or four brothers. So they got together, I think they formed a group in 1938, something like that, in Chapala. And they wanted to grow the group, you know, but there wasn't enough uh, work. So they ended up uh, going to Mexicali, the border town. And uh, when they left for Mexicali, I think it was in 1949, around there. Uh, that's, I was born there in 1958, and my two older sisters and one older brother we were all born in Mexicali. But that's when they came to Mexicali, and uh, from there they started getting contracts. It was called Mariachi Chapala. They started getting contracts to come to L.A. at a place called Jeanette's Place, and another one called El Granada Nightclub, which is right on Figueroa Street, where the Staples Center is, basically. Learning um, the language, was that an issue? Um, you mentioned a little story, can you mention <laughs> to the public a little bit? Well, yeah, you know, growing up, you know, you're three and a half, whatever, you know, in LA. And then I remember we moved in, we moved to Pico Rivera 
and I started going to kindergarten. It was crazy because I thought everybody was like an alien, you know, like they're from another planet. I didn't understand what they were saying. So I would basically be all uh, scared, you know, and I'd cry for about, for about two weeks. And my older sister would go pick me up and walk me home. You know, and my father goes, your sister better not bring you home anymore because you're crying. You gotta stop crying. And uh, yeah, he made me understand very well. And I just remember, you know, little by little, making friends in school and assimilating to, to everything, you know, watching cartoons in English. So I, I learned English pretty quick. So Mr. Maestro Jose, who was your first music teacher? Well, I started playing the trumpet at 10 years old in, in public school. And my first band teacher was Mr. Tervosky. He was a sort of like a half Russian, half Jewish, you know, background. He was a viola player and violin player. And he, he was amazing. He was also the, the music teacher for my older brother, Jesus, uh, who was in middle school at that time. He played first trumpet. And when I started playing trumpet at fourth grade, I played first trumpet also. What was great about him is that he, I think once I got into seventh grade, which was middle school at that time, he goes, Jose, how come you and your brother Jesus learn music so quick? You learn the stuff, you practically memorize. I go, well, my, my dad's a mariachi, you know, he's a musician. Really, and what does he play? I go, violin. He goes, I play violin. He goes, Do you, does he play in a group? I go, yes, he has a, he has a group. It's called Mariachi Los Galleros, which, which was formed like around 1967. Mind you, this was like around 1970, 71, when I was a seventh grader. And he goes, you have a picture, can you bring it? And I go, yeah. So I, I took him a, a PR picture that my dad had of the group, uh, glossy black and white at the Santa Anita racetrack. That's where they used to play sometimes. And he goes, wow, you know, the group was really, really, looked really good. And he put it up on his, uh, like a little bulletin board that he had in his office. I felt so proud because all my friends, when they would walk into the office, they would see the picture and say, oh, this is your dad. So I was never ashamed of saying that my dad was a mariachi, you know. Even though during that time, just saying that you were Mexican, 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 it was tough sometimes because the Mexican-Americans, sometimes they weren't too nice to Mexicans, Mexicans, you know. There was still like a split at that time, you know, and we've gotten past that now. We're way, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot different now. But during that time, it was, it was very difficult, you know. But, you know, I think Mr. Tervosky, he made it, you know, so easy for me to be able to to do what I love to do, you know, to be a good student. Maybe that's why I, I've been involved in music education all these years, because of the example that he set for me, you know, to be, you know, inclusive with, with, with everyone. It doesn't matter the race. Hey, you, you're part Asian and you want to learn mariachi? Hey, let me share my culture with you. It doesn't matter, you know, you see people pass their, their ethnicity, their color. So you got to love everybody the same, you know. And Mr. Trubosky was a perfect example of that. And so since then on, you've lived in the United States and you've developed your mariachi band. You have mm -hmm. two. Can you mention them? Well, you know, my, my dad came with Mariachi Chapala, you know, and when we uh, immigrated over here, I think it was 1962. Uh, after that, they formed a group called Mariachi Los Galleros. And uh, I played there, started playing there in 1975 on and off. And then full time in 1976, I left my family's group and I formed my own group in 1981 called Mariachi Sol de Mexico. I was going through music school. That's the only way that I could put myself through music school, uh, going five days a week to music school and working on the weekends with my group. Uh, about, I would assume about six months after I formed my group, uh, Juan Gabriel, who was a very, very popular composer in Mexico, singer songwriter, he heard, uh, the first album that I did for my group, and he liked it. He goes, they recorded that in L.A.? He goes, yeah, because it's very, I think very few artists really came to L.A. to record with mariachis. Everybody recorded it in uh, Mexico City. And uh, yeah, he got a hold of me and he asked me to record uh, with him. And soon after that, many people started asking me to record, you know, to write arrangements for them. So by 1986, I had, you know, enough money 
to invest in a restaurant. So I bought a restaurant in uh, the city of South Almani, and I named it Cielito Lindo, and I had that for about 34 years. But in 1991, uh, it, I was doing so good in the business, I wanted to form a foundation to help kids uh, study music in the inner cities. You know, people, you know, kids that were economically challenged, you know, their parents. So I made it very, very affordable for them to, to study music, mariachi music in the inner cities. And uh, half of those kids were little girls and they didn't have any role models. There were no female groups. So I decided to form the first, America's first all-female mariachi in 1994, Mariachi Reina de Los Angeles. So that's how, you know, I had Sol de Mexico and, and uh, Reina de Los Angeles was born. And their first show was really, it was really cool because uh, it was a fundraiser for my foundation at the San, Gab San Gabriel Civic Auditorium where the mission is. And for that show, I had invited Lucha Villa, uh, Miguel Aceves Mejia, and Lola Beltran, all three of them. And when Lola uh, Beltran saw the girls for the first time, she goes, ¿Y estas? Who are these girls? And I go, oh, they're called Maria Chirreina de Los Angeles. And she became their madrina, right? Their godmother that day, uh, that evening, actually. It, it, was, it was pretty nice. It was, it was great. And the girls have been going strong ever since. They got inducted into the Smithsonian Institute in Washington as uh, women that, that really helped uh, change Latino culture in the United States through music. So that was a big thing for them. This was a couple of years ago. Yes, but you were behind that. I, I wasn't, when I formed the group, I wasn't thinking, oh, you know, I want to do it to do. I just was doing what I love to do and, and also doing what I think was right. You know, we have a lot of gr little girls studying music and uh, to not have any role models, you know, was really hard. Little boys say, oh, I want to play with Sol one day, Sol de Mexico. But the little girls didn't have a, you know, a role model group, you know, so here, that's why I formed them. And I guess, you know, good things come, come after, you know, uh, when you do things with passion and with, with love and with honesty. It's very true. And you have stuck to that in everything that you've done. And I think it shows with, and that's why you have all these people that come to you. Um, because it, your reputation precedes you and also your love for the music, for mariachi. Well, I think consistency is very important, right? When you, when you love something, you have to be consistent. You can't flake out, you know, after, what, six months or something with, you know, when you start something. You have to be consistent and you always have to set a high standard for yourself. And sometimes people don't understand that, people that are around you. You know, you want them to rise, you know, to the occasion, you know, and say, hey, you know, be careful when you, when you put on the mariachi suit, for instance, you know. Make sure that your boots are clean. Make sure that, that your moño is together, that everybody's got the same belt, that every, you know, everything's coordinated because we're representing not only a, a certain genre of music, we're representing a whole country and a whole culture, you know. So it, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun to do when you, love, when you love what you're doing, right? What would you say to the young Latinos out there um, who would like to aspire to something similar to yours or, or just aspire to something that might not be as common, mm. uh, what would you say to them? Well, I, what I would say to the younger generations is just to, uh, to really stick with it, to be um, very disciplined about the craft that you love. You know, if it's mariachi, you know, put your 100% into it. You know, it's very important that, that uh, there is a, a certain respect for a tradition because it is a tradition, mariachi music is a tradition. It's not a type of music that's, that's uh, being changed or the instrumentation's being changed all the time. Yes, you know, we've recorded, for instance us, we've recorded with the Beach Boys, we've recorded with Green Day. We've, you know, they've asked us to record and use mariachi instruments in their recordings sometimes and, and being involved in movies and stuff like that. We show the musicianship that a mariachi musician can have but that doesn't mean that we're going to change our whole tradition. When we present ourselves, it's the mariachi ensemble, the sombrero, the whole thing, you know. Um, sometimes when we play with symphony orchestras, it's the mariachi in front of the orchestra. And um, it's nice to, to have them see that a mariachi musician is a trained musician also, that we could write for symphony orchestras. We, do, we could orchestrate for them, you know, we could conduct an orchestra. And, we're, we're living in a fun time, you know, when it comes to mariachi music. It's evolved a lot, 
but yet the tradition has been um, very well kept, you know, I think. And that's very important. Yes, yes. And I think Mariachi Reina, the all-female group, you know, they also re respect it. Uh, they respect the tradition. When they come out, you know, they come out with their sombreros, you know, and it's, it's, it's really fun to see because it's, you know, it's very easy to, to follow a fad, a musical fad, you know. Uh, but these girls, you know, they, they just, they love what they do. They love mariachi. They love the traditional songs and they, they, they stick with it. They love it. And they love, they love me to challenge them too musically. And you do? Do you, Maestro? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, they have a new album that just came out a few months back called Que Vivan Las Mujeres, Maria Chirreina de Los Angeles. And um, it's an awesome album. You know, they could get it, you know, people could get it in every, in every platform out there, you know, digital platform. It's, once they hear the group, they're going to say, wow, these girls are amazing. The vocalists, you know, all the singers, they all sing. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing to see. And you mentioned how you have now like a second generation coming yes. back. Yes, yeah, it's incredible, you know. You go year by year by year. Now these girls, I formed the group in 1994. So um, one girl, Monica, she plays Vihuela. Her mother used to play in Reina. Imagine, her mother was 14 when she played in Maria Chirrena in Los Angeles, like in 1996, 97, 98. And now, uh, uh, one of our first violinists, Anisette, her mother was a guitar player for Reina in, when I formed the group in 1994. So it's like a full, full circle. It's really amazing to see. It's great. You know, the, these girls feel very, uh, uh, I think they, they feel a lot of pride when they play with Reina because they knew that their moms played there in that group too, you know, and they're continuing that tradition. There's going to be a milestone going on with them, right, very soon? Well, yeah, they're, they're, it's going to, in 2024, they'll be, uh, the group will be celebrating their 30th anniversary, you imagine. So uh, at the end of this year, in December, they're going to be performing with Sol together. It's one of the few times that we do perform together. It's going to be at the Cerritos Performing Arts Center, December 4th and 5th for our, uh, Mariachi Christmas. We call it Mariachi Christmas Concert. And uh, we've been doing that show for about almost 20 years, I think. And it, it's always fun, you know, because we get to see, you know, our community go there. It's close by. You know, it's part of our tour of Sol de Mexico's Christmas tour. But it's, it's, it's a fun show because both groups are playing together. Can you tell us what are the dates, the times, and the location? Well, yeah, it's going to be December 4th and 5th at uh, the Cerritos Performing Arts Center. Uh, the show on the 4th, I think, starts around 7 p.m. I mean, they would have to call there the, the Performing Arts Center. And on the 5th, I think it's a, more of a daytime show, maybe at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock. Uh, like I said, it's fun. You know, both shows usually sell out. Uh, and uh, it's great. It's pretty amazing when you hear both groups playing the Nutcracker, a tribute to Tchaikovsky, you know, his music. And you go, what? You know, they're playing dun -dun 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 very classical. But it's, it's really cool because we get to showcase the musicianship of both groups, you know. It, it's the, the people just, they, they love it. But you've done so much more. Um, one of the things that I would like to mention is you have, you help create a trumpet as well, right? <laughs> yeah, like, it, there's always something that's linked to music that I'm involved with because I love it so much. Uh, Con Selmer, uh, the company Con Selmer, they make amazing instruments, you know, they, their instruments are, are played, you know, in all the colleges, you know, great jazz musicians, and they asked me one day to, to help them develop a mariachi trumpet, and I go, well, I'll help you develop a good trumpet, you know, that classical players could play and jazz players could play. But uh, yeah, I, I, I helped them about, I think about five years ago or six years ago, and uh, it's a pretty neat Buck Stradivarius trumpet. It sells all over the world. And I also help develop some instruments that are like a signature series with my name, Jose Hernandez. And uh, yeah, they're sold in a lot of schools, a lot of school programs by, by my instruments. And, uh, they give me the opportunity to teach mariachi music also throughout the country. 
you know, start mariachi programs all over the place. So thanks to Con Selmer and another company, uh, West Music, you know, I've been able to help uh, start programs in about 37 states, you know. So it, it's it's pretty, it's it, it's a certain part of my of my life and my career. And to me, it's just a blessing. That's, I mean, I never expected to to start a line of instruments, you know, but I, I guess certain people think that, wow, you know, Jose is sort of a symbol, you know, to mariachi music. So uh, I was very fortunate to be able to do that. You've been awarded awards, not only Latin Grammys. Yes, we've been nominated. <laughs> it's funny. I've been nominated 11 times, I think, you know, with Reina's. Uh, albums and with Sol de Mexico's albums and also as an arranger producer for artists right and uh, I've never won but I've been nominated so many times and they're all my friends you know and I continue to support them um, because I I love what they do you know when it comes to uh, music in general you know I'm involved with them a lot uh, and I continue to support them for me it's it's just it's a great way to promote groups you know and their and their craft uh, the latin grammys and the and the american grammys uh, we've performed in their shows many times you know accompanying alejandro fernandez pedro pedro fernandez pepe aguilar vicente fernandez you know just a whole bunch of artists uh, in the, uh, the most popular in the in industry but you know we've also traveled a lot we traveled seven years with with Luis Miguel, and Luis Miguel is is one of the top performers, I think, in Latin music today. So traveling the world with him was really fun. We started that in 2006, and we worked with him up to 2012, I think. This year, you were awarded an award, a special award. Can you mention that one? Well, you know, sometimes when you do what, what you love to do through the years, and you're, there's consistency, you don't realize, you know, that that people sometimes they, they look at what you've done in the past. And I was very, very fortunate, very honored to to receive the the Cesar Chavez Legacy Award. Me and uh, I think four others that have done a lot for, for our community and for for Latino culture in the, in the United States. It was really fun, you know, because I used to go as a kid and go with my mother to early Mart. And she used to go... Uh, Pick grapes. She was one of the farm workers there, so she worked with my tia, my tia Chuy. We used to call her my tia Chuy, my tia Jesus, and uh, they they worked hard. And I, you know, would see uh, the amount of hours they would put in, you know, to to help their family. So I spent a lot of summers, even though I was like maybe seven, eight years old, nine years old, up there, you know. And uh, uh, they supported Caesar a lot, you know, through through the '60s, and uh, it was during the hard, those hard times. Uh, and here, you know, after, what, 45 years or something, uh, I get awarded, you know, this, uh, this legacy award by Caesar's son, you know, and uh, it's pretty amazing. You know, we were very fortunate also in the late 80s to play a couple of times when he was celebrating, you know, coming off of his hunger strikes. So we went to go play at his ranch several times, you know. But the sad thing about it is that every time we played, he'd be so skinny because of, you know, of the hunger strikes. And, and having to see his mother hold him was like the, the saddest thing. You know, so we were there to, you know, to play happy music and to do that. But sometimes it was really difficult. You know, you, you'd see a lot of people from Hollywood, a lot of actors that supported Caesar uh, there. I think it was 1988. We had, I had just opened my restaurant for two years, two years before that. And we got a call, hey, can you play for Cesar Chavez? There's gonna be a celebration. He's gonna finish his hunger strike, you know. Um, yeah, it's, he, was, he was an amazing person. Caesar was an amazing person. He, he impacted a, a, a lot of people and, you know, the whole insecticide thing, you know, and uh, they were just spraying over a lot of immigrants, a lot of people that were working in the fields. And he was fighting for that, you know, so going through the whole uh, uh, grape boycott, you know, and all, all these uh, uh, things that they used to pick, you know, for all the supermarkets was very difficult for him. 
you know, a lot of people didn't understand, but his movement survived, and here we are today, you know, a big difference, and you know, the, the working conditions are better now. Now, there's also some other milestones you would like to mention. There's a 30 and a 40. Oh mention. my God, the, the, well, the years fly. The, the years fly. This year, Maria Chisol de Mexico is celebrating their 40th anniversary. So, um, I think sometime uh, early next year, there's going to be a book coming out. Uh, the official name I still don't have. Uh, Will you come back and mention that book? Well, we'll talk about it, yeah, of okay. course. Yeah, that would be fun. Uh, and also an album is going to come out. Uh, maybe in December, some of the singles will come out of the album. Um, it's a 40th anniversary album. And um, also Marechi Reina, well, in a couple of years, will be celebrating their 30th. But my uh, foundation, Marechi Heritage Society, this year celebrates 30 years also. So it's... Uh, it's pretty neat. Sometimes I totally forget. I go, what is this? That like every ten years something happens. I I, I don't get it. You know, I, starting Seoul, 1981, 1991. Here I come up with my foundation, and here in 2021 I open my new restaurant too. Where is it? Yeah, the new restaurant. It's called Casa del Sol. It's here at the uh, the Legacy Mall at the district here in the city of Tustin. Uh, we're there. We're the only Mexican restaurant there. We have live entertainment. The Sol de Mexico plays there, and also Reina they play there. So it's a, their dinner shows. It's fun, you know. It's uh, it's something very very new to the to the area. So, you know, so people are are going. They love the food. They love the drinks, and uh, it's a very beautiful place. You know, we have a lot of museum pieces in there. A lot of things that were given uh, to us through the years to my family. We have certain uh, trajes, you know, that belong to Vicente Fernandez that he gave to us. Uh, Jenny Rivera, you know, she, uh, her uh, designer gave me the, the last, uh, one of the last dresses that she had made for her. She never picked it up because of the, her accident, right? And um, I have that there. I have dresses of Vicky Carr, Amalia Mendoza, it's really neat. It's really neat. The place is beautiful. I will definitely. You have go to go. There. Casa yeah. del Sol. That's the name of it. Yeah. Casa del Sol. Yes. So I'm gonna mention your health. Mm -hmm. You had a few scares. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you mention those? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it was was it a? I think maybe. Going on three years, we were up in Oregon, doing a concert, and uh, right in the middle of the show, I was playing. I played a high note, you know, like I normally do sometimes, and I, I felt my rib like it cracked or something, and I lost all air pressure, you know? And uh, that night I couldn't sleep, and I had to fly back, you know, to see my doctor. And uh, he told me, you know, I, I see something, but I wanna recommend you to a, an oncologist here in Newport, right? So I went, they did the whole x-ray MRIs, and they detected that I had a multiple myeloma, right? So it's a sort of form of a bone cancer or something like that, right? And so I went through treatment. Uh, they kept me very, very, almost like in remission for about a year because I had a whole bunch of concerts, right? I couldn't cancel. Uh, after a year, I went to Cedar sinai and they did a stem cell transplant and uh, it worked for about a year and a half on me because I had a serious, you know, a very aggressive cell, you know, cancer cell. So it, it creeped back a little bit. So then they started a new treatment, uh, immunotherapy, and it brought me down again almost to remission. But then uh, we started performing again, so, you know, about three months ago or something in August, and uh, I got COVID. You know, when I got COVID, uh, I ended up in the hospital because, you know, I was, my immune system was low as it was, you know. So, um, yeah, I was there for 26 days. It was really difficult, you know. They gave me like 10, what was it? Two complete tre treatments of rendesivir because the first time they did it, it didn't do anything for me. And I was getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, the doctors, yeah, they thought I wasn't going to survive, you know. 
but you know, prayer and your faith, you know, means a lot. And the people who surround you, uh, there was a lot of prayer for me, you know, my closest friends and, uh, and it worked, you know, I never, I was never scared. I was never afraid. You know, I would always thank God, you know, thank you for healing me, for healing my blood, for healing my, my bones, you know, for healing me from COVID. And when I came out and now, like they said, you know, his lungs are just destroyed. So now they did the last x-ray they did maybe two weeks ago. The doctors go, oh my God, your lungs are, you have no, no pneumonia, I had double, double pneumonia. Your lungs are clear. You're like a, at 100%. Yes, I'm still like winded. You could hear it when I talk, uh, but much better, much better. You know, I'm very, very grateful. You know, all the staff, all the, the nurses at the hospital that took care of me. It was just, it's just amazing. You, know, you see how fragile our bodies are and how important our health is. You know, you just try to, to take care of yourself as much as you can. Uh, it was crazy because I wanted to be there uh, when my restaurant opened, I wasn't there. You know, they would send me some pictures and I was there writing music in my hospital room. Even though they were giving me 100% oxygen, I was writing music for my daughter's wedding and she wanted me to walk down the aisle. And it was crazy because the doctor, when, when they told him, you know what, I don't, I don't think he's gonna make it. And my daughter goes, I don't, I don't receive that. My dad's gonna walk me down the aisle at my wedding. He, he'll be there and he's gonna be your miracle doctor. My dad's gonna be your miracle. And yeah, 10 days after that, I was out of the hospital. Imagine, I was there 26 days, 10 days before I got out of the hospital, he, he said he didn't think I was going to make it. And after that, there I was, you know, walking my daughter down the aisle. Yes, I had oxygen, but I was walking her down the aisle and I was out of the hospital. I believe you've said as well that for, for those who do end up joining the musical groups mm -hmm. in their schools, the involvement changes them, right? Yes, being part of, a, being part of something uh, positive like belonging in a mariachi program, mariachi group in the schools, it's very positive because it gives you a sense of identity, a sense of belonging. You know, the music is beautiful. You know, you get to wear the suit once you learn enough songs, right? It's, um, I've seen it all over, all over the country. It's changed a lot of lives. You know, I could tell you one story. Um, one of the first programs that we had, that my foundation had, was at my, elementary school where I, where I grew up in Pico Rivera, in North Ranchito Elementary School. And one of the students there was very, very quiet. He, little kid, wouldn't say nothing. He was like maybe nine or 10. And we asked one day, well, what's wrong with him? How come he early talks? And then they let us know, well, you know, his, uh, his mother, I think it was his mother, or, or he saw, his father killed his mother in Mexico. And they sent him to Los Angeles to live with his grandmother, you know? So he was traumatized. And uh, two weeks into the mariachi program, you know, he started learning guitar. All of a sudden he started singing. He started playing around with all, the, with all his compañeros, you know, with all, all his little friends, you know, in the group. It changed his life completely. His grades got better. You know, all that is, is, music is a gift. You know, I'm not saying no, it's only mariachi music, but music in general is a gift. And we started programs in Nashville, for instance, and, um, I think with two middle schools and a high school. And the Latino graduating percentage was 42% from high school. Only 42% of Latinos. After four years, it went up to 93% because of the mariachi programs. So I've seen it, you know, change lives. And um, I think that's why the mariachi programs continue to grow and grow and grow through the Midwest, you know, back East, and here in the Southwest and in the West Coast. How can teachers or schools get in touch with your program? Well, they could go into uh, mariachiheritagesociety.com or, um, they could go into our website, which is soldemexicomusic.com, and they could see the, you know, the whole uh, 
I think the whole spectrum of what we're involved with through education, the restaurant, and also our concerts that we do. And that's a, that's a good way to, to get information. Thank you so much oh. for joining us today. Thank My you very Estero much, Jose Jackie. Then. You make it very easy. Thank you so much. <laughs>